So hello and welcome to the video. This video has been on my to-do list for quite some time now, but my recent trip to Egypt thrust it to the front of the queue. I wanted to share six practical tips for travelling in, well let's say for travelling in challenging territories. Now the words challenging territory are quite carefully chosen. Many people might not consider Egypt to be particularly challenging, and it isn't, certainly not in comparison to places like South Sudan. But many others would find anywhere where you don't speak the language, or anywhere that has a different written text, to be quite a challenging place to travel. Either way, I hope at least some of these six tips will be useful to you, so if you'd like to know what they are, stick around! Experimenting with not having my usual intro video, so let's get straight into item number one. Local taxis can be a real pain in the neck. Even if a taxi has a metre, that's not a cast iron guarantee that the fare will be fair, and I'm looking at you, Budapest. But if there is no metre, you have to agree the fare before you set out. And that involves haggling, which many people hate but you just cannot avoid in certain parts of the world. So information is king. Many airports will have a little board in the arrivals hall detailing what you should expect to pay for a taxi fare. That's also information that you can Google before you leave home. If you're taking a taxi from your hotel, the guys on the front desk will generally be able to give you a fairly good idea of what a trip in a local taxi should be costing you. Basically, a few moments research before you start a journey will make the negotiation process much more straightforward. Now, when haggling in markets, the advice is usually to counter-offer a number just under half of what the merchant originally suggested. My experience is that that won't usually work with taxis because they tend to offer a figure that is much closer to the true fare at the outset. So if you have an idea of what the fare should be, counter-offer a bit lower than that and allow yourself to be haggled up. Haggle with a smile, try to enjoy the process, and remember the drivers do this all day every day and they will have forgotten the negotiation very quickly, probably before you've even got in their cab. And remember you're often arguing about trivial amounts, I found myself arguing over 70p. Now that's not a reason to give in and pay an inflated fare, but it is an asymmetric negotiation. A small amount to you may be a large amount to the person that you're haggling with. If you aren't starting from somewhere where you can easily independently verify what price you should be paying before you start, here's a quick tip. It's fairly easy to find the cost of hiring a local taxi for a full day online. That is then a useful number to have in mind. A quick online search suggests that a taxi can be hired for a full day in Luxor for between 500 and 700 Egyptian pounds, which is about 25 to 35 British pounds. So a 15 minute short distance trip would cost, I don't know, maybe 10% of that, so perhaps 50 to 70 Egyptian pounds. It's not as accurate as asking someone locally, but it is a good backstop technique to have in mind. Tip two is also about getting around when overseas, and specifically getting back to your hotel. Hotels change names, their name may be pronounced differently in the local language. There may be more than one hotel with the same name. There are plenty of pitfalls which may result in a driver getting lost or getting confused. Doing so could be accidental or deliberate, but either way it will reopen the negotiation, usually not in your favour. So always get a business card from the hotel and take it with you when you leave. This will clearly communicate the hotel's name and address, often in the local language, and will often include a little map and some guidance to help the taxi drivers find it. It'll be much more effective than any key card holder the hotel will give you when checking in. If you know how much you should be paying and you have a card for your hotel, the negotiation should be quick and effective. Let me take this opportunity to invite you to click the like button if you're getting something from this video. Please subscribe if you're new and leave me a comment too. Is this interesting? Is this helpful? Or am I just being a bit patronising? Let me know. So tip number three is about blending in and not looking like a tourist, which will put a target on your back. And that is how you dress. If you wear an I'm with stupid t-shirt with shorts and flip-flops when wandering through central Cairo, you will look like a right tourist. 
tourist and will enjoy the benefits of doing so. And by benefits I mean that every vendor within a mile will hone in on you to offer you their excellent wares. Now in the more touristy areas like Luxor where there isn't really an expat community this isn't going to make such a difference. But when I am somewhere more urban I try to dress more like a local expat would when wandering around. Mainly this means I wear long trousers, usually jeans, even if that makes me a little more uncomfortable than I might be if I were wearing shorts. But I feel it really makes me seem less of a target so is worth the inconvenience. In a similar vein I tend to walk purposefully and try to look as if I know where I'm going. A cheeky bonus tip here is to work out which side of the road the traffic drives on. Pedestrians tend to walk on the same side of the pavement or sidewalk as the traffic. Us Brits tend to be constantly bumping into people when we're overseas because we drive on the left in this country whereas most of the rest of the world drives on the right. When I was scripting this I was keen to avoid sounding like a 19th century British explorer who wanted to avoid interaction with the natives at all costs. Experiencing the vibrancy of local environments is a key part of the travel experience and what we may diagnose as hassle is only a local shopkeeper trying to make you aware of their wares. After all you have gone to their city and you probably are interested in what they have to sell. And after the last two years we've all had their enthusiasm to make a sale has never been higher. Which brings me to point four. Be sceptical about what you hear but remember that fundamentally people are decent. It's rare for people to just lie to you but it happens. Just after I filmed this a guy stopped and explained that it was a statue of a local political leader. He was dressed smartly, said he worked at the Marriott and was keen to practice his English. All very reasonable. I said I was heading to the Egyptian Museum that was just across the Nile from where we met. And that's when he started to lie to me. He said the museum was closed today because a government minister was visiting. But a bazaar just over there was open today and it was the only day of the week when it was open and amazingly his sister had a stall in that bazaar where she sold art and he would be able to get me a superb discount. Now by the end of that I could see what he was up to but on the way through it wasn't automatically clear that he was lying to me. But the Egyptian Museum is one of the largest earners in the entire country so it would have to be a pretty senior minister that closed it. Secondly there is no tourist bazaar anywhere in Egypt that is only open one day a week. This sheep market under a motorway bridge only formed once a week but it wasn't exactly a tourist mecca. And I'd already walked through the area the guy indicated and I knew that there was no bazaar over there. But on the other hand on a couple of occasions people approached me once to carry my bags, another to offer their taxi and when I politely but firmly declined they actually then gave me some really helpful information. This guy showing me where the best security desk was to enter Cairo airport. So remember that people are fundamentally good and people working in the tourism industry recognise how important the sector is to them and will want to help tourists even if it has no direct economic benefit to them. Even if there will be the occasional bad penny who just lies to you. Tip number five is maps. Wandering around holding a paper map is route one to getting hassled. On the other hand looking at your phone is entirely normal. Roaming while abroad can be very expensive. But even without having roaming on you can still use the Google Maps app. Google gives you the opportunity to download maps and access them offline. And even if you don't roam your phone will still be regularly making contact with surrounding mobile towers. Do you want to connect? No. Do you want to connect? No. And so on. So your phone will still be triangulating its location and Google Maps will still show you that little dot on the map of where you are even if you're not roaming. And even if you do roam you can burn through a tremendous amount of bandwidth by accessing Google Maps in a live environment. So that is a really handy tip that is not widely known and it is really helpful to still be able to access your location on Google Maps even when you're not roaming. And finally tip six is to invest a little bit of time before you go on learning a couple of words of the language and perhaps also learning the numbers. 
So language first, and literally two or three words can really break down some barriers. My Arabic is limited to salam, which means hello. It's actually short for salam alaikum, if you want to get some bonus marks. Shukran means thank you, and inch Allah means God willing, which is useful and usually raises a smile. I can also report that Muhammad Salah also works very well in Egypt right now. In the Middle East, numbers can trip you up too. The numbers us English speakers use are very confusingly called Arabic numerals, or to be precise, Western Arabic numerals. The Arab world widely uses what is known as the Eastern Arabic numeral system. Almost all of the banknotes in the Middle East carry both numbering systems, but some don't. And if you're in a hurry, or if you're in the dark, or if someone is in the process of trying to rip you off, it's quite handy to be able to read the Arab numbering to be able to know which banknotes you're handling. Even if you just learn the five and the zero symbol, that will really help you out. This is really a Middle Eastern tip as the rest of the world seems quite happy to use the Western Arabic numeral system. But knowing about it and spending a couple of minutes thinking about it may well save you some hassle. So there you go, six hopefully useful tips to have in mind when travelling somewhere unfamiliar. The world is an amazing place. We all should get out and see as much of it as possible, and having these little tools in your arsenal will make that process a little less challenging. So thanks for watching. Please like, comment and subscribe. You know the drill. And I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.